Well, I want to, let's open in prayer. Lots of praying this morning. Praying is always good. Father, we just, we thank you for your presence that's already here. Lord, that you have already declared yourself as our victor, as our defender, as the one who meets our needs and the one who fills every empty place within us. And Father, I thank you that that's a promise that you give us in scripture. And Lord, I just speak that over every person here. And Lord, as we open your word and as we, we look at just these different topics, Lord, I ask that that you would just quicken our hearts, that you would give us wisdom, that you would just give us revelation of who you are and who we are as a result. And we just give this time to you. We praise you. We bless you and we glorify your name in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> so we've been talking about the four needs that we all have, the soul needs that can only be met by God, love, acceptance, worth, and security. Last week, Ryan talked about love. So today I'm going to attempt <laughs> to cram two of them into one week. We'll see how this goes. Um, I'm, and I'm grouping them together because they are very similar and there's a lot of similarities between them. And so sometimes it can be hard to separate them, but here goes, I'm gonna try. <clears throat> um, the first one I wanna talk about is acceptance. And acceptance is defined as a God-given need in every person, regardless of culture, nationality, gender, age, or race, to feel welcomed and received without fear of ever being rejected or criticized or judged. That's a tall order for us, for us people, isn't it? <laughs> but this is what acceptance is. There's a few reasons why we need acceptance. Um, the primary reason we need it is the same reason why we need all of these needs is uh, all of the four ones, which it's in our DNA because God put it there. Everyone is born with a need to be acceptable. It's just, it's what we need. And God put it there because he is the one that can meet it. So on a person to person level, acceptance allows us to experience community and fellowship with others. It banishes loneliness basically. Um, and it gives us a sense of belonging. And this is what acceptance is really all about at its core is we need to belong. We need to belong to something, <laughs> to a group, to a family. And we will not experience belonging until we are, until we feel accepted by whomever. <clears throat> so... In today's day, we have more people on the planet than ever before. But the, the need for people and the search for people to find a place to belong is manic. I mean, it's just, it's, it's out of control. And it's why so many people, I think, are so desperate to put a label on everything. They want to label absolutely everything because they are desperate to find somebody else, a group of people that is like them so that they feel like they can belong. But having our sole need of acceptance, having that need met is essential in breaking free from our flesh patterns. And so labeling everything and trying, you know, just putting everything out there to try to find somebody else who is like you is not going to break you free from flesh patterns. So um, when I talk about flesh patterns and acceptance, I'm not talking about being accepted by other people. There is that. But when we go back to this thing of being accepted by God and meeting that deep soul need, that's not going to happen on a person to person basis <clears throat> because uh, acceptance from people as we all know and have experienced, is very temporary. It's extremely temporary. And you will always need more of it because you will, it will never quite hit the mark. There will just be something about it that just doesn't hit home. It doesn't, well, you accept me, but you don't accept everything. 
And so that is why on a person to person basis, we're never going to have it met. It's very temporary and a lot of times very surface. So we will inevitably experience rejection, right? Uh, so we either blame people for rejecting us. This is our normal MO. And then we move on to the next person because they're, they're rejecting me. So I'm going to move on to the next person or we blame ourselves, which leads to then worthlessness, feelings of worthlessness and loneliness, which I will get to in a little bit, hopefully. So, um, if there's one thing to take away from these few weeks that we're talking about needs, um, it's, we can't stress it enough and you'll probably hear it every single week. <laughs> we cannot meet each other's needs of love, acceptance, worth, and security. We cannot do it. I cannot meet your need. You cannot meet my need. And so to put that on each other is it's impossible. It's an impossible imperative. And so having God meet our needs of love and acceptance and worth and security, that is what is essential in breaking our flesh patterns, not having other people meet your needs, but having God meet your needs. So our flesh patterns are based in performance based acceptance. If you have, if you've been to, if you had gone to grace for any length of time, you have probably heard this talked about a lot. Performance-based acceptance. And until we understand and believe that we are acceptable to God, but not just that we're acceptable to God, but why we are acceptable to God. Because, you know, we can know in our heads, yes, I'm acceptable to God. But if you don't understand why, then, you know, that it feels like you can lose sight of it. But if you understand why you're acceptable to God, then you will be able to break free and experience healing in those areas where you need to be healed. <clears throat> so I want to talk about what makes us unacceptable first, before I talk about what makes us acceptable. Um, we know pretty much, we know this in the world, what makes us unacceptable in the world, not agreeing with somebody, uh, behaving unacceptably, saying the wrong thing, uh, if we're not dressed right, you know, our outward appearance. I mean, we could just be unacceptable by association. The, the world has very high standards of unacceptability. <laughs> uh, but what makes us unacceptable to God? Because here I am talking about we are accepted by God, but now I'm going to turn it around and say, what makes us unacceptable to God? So... Okay, if, if we don't behave like scripture says we should behave, or if we do behave like scripture says we shouldn't behave, or if we have a lack of faith, or if we don't love people, these are some things that people might say would make us unacceptable to God. We all have a list, whether we like to admit it or not, we have a list. But there is only one thing that makes us unacceptable to God, and it is none of those things. So if you look at Romans 5, 18 to 19, it says, Therefore, as through one, one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Paul can't really talk about what makes us unacceptable without in the same breath rejoicing at what makes us acceptable. <laughs> so, spoiler alert. <clears throat> um, sin. The sin nature that Adam has passed down all the way back to there, and it's passed down all through the line, this is what makes us unacceptable to God. And so we see here, though, that God has made a provision for that. But there are two systems of gaining acceptance. There is the system of law and there's the system of grace. We all are very familiar with the system of law. So we're all born into it. This is what unbelievers live under. This is what you live under when you have sin nature. 
And unfortunately, even though they've been set free from it, uh, most Christians stay under this system as well. Uh, the system of law is based on achieving by self-effort or on certain standards, whichever standards you have for your life. This is performance-based acceptance. So we learn to equate acceptable behavior with acceptable self. If I behave good enough, then I will be good enough, right? And <clears throat> the performance is based on well, how we perform. It's based on how good we are at fleshly techniques. <laughs> so like, if I look right, if I have the right stuff, if I earn the right degrees, if I have the right skills, say the right thing, if I change my personality to the right mold, then people will accept me and I will be okay. <coughs> that is, that's the system that we live under for years. The trap of it is that the focus of our lives is still self. It's all about me. We don't, it doesn't feel like it, you know, because we're working so hard to prove to other people that we're acceptable and we're trying to please them, we're trying to meet their needs, we're trying to live up to their standards. So it doesn't feel like my life is all about myself. But look at it. What are you constantly focused on? your performance. How am I measuring up to them? How am I performing? Am I okay? Am I accepted? So the focus is always on me and what I'm doing or what I'm not doing. This produces self-righteousness. Romans 4, 4 says, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. There's a price tag that comes along with performance-based acceptance. And so it becomes a burden and it's a debt that we have to continue to pay. We have to continue to keep it up. And this is where fatigue and getting burned out comes from, but that's a whole other topic. <clears throat> because of this, this is how we've learned to be accepted. We in turn then do the same to other people. Um, and then the cycle just continues. And the deeper you go into it, the lower your capacity is to handle rejection and shame and judgment. So if you remember the start of this whole series was Ryan was talking about capacity. If you do not feel accepted, then you will have a low capacity to handle rejection. It's, you know, pretty, pretty logical thought process. One of the biggest price tags of performance-based acceptance is the inevitable rejection that you will experience. Uh, we've all experienced it. So you may have heard this saying, there are two types of people in the world, those who have been rejected and those who have been rejected more. <clears throat> we've all been rejected. Um, when we are rejected, then we reject others. That's just kind of the way it happens. Experiencing rejection without processing it correctly plummets our capacity to receive acceptance and to also accept others. It's just this vicious circle. You want to be accepted, but the more you're rejected, the less you can accept being accepted. <laughs> that makes sense. That's because rejection leads to shame. And shame is a belief system that says, I am a mistake. I, there's something wrong with me. I am flawed. It's identity based. And when you have an, it's identity based belief system and therefore it can only be healed by identity based truth. So the world's solution, because honestly, the world, even the world acknowledges that this doesn't work. You get burnout, you get tired, and you look online, there are tons of articles that you can find on self-acceptance, which is their answer to the system of law and performance-based acceptance, which is self-acceptance. Self-acceptance is the way to inner peace, according to the world, or at least according to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, while you, we believe, as believers, we know that that's not true. We know that the path to inner peace is not self-acceptance. We know that. 
but there's always a but there does some seem to be some validity to them to this point on some level um you need to learn how to accept yourself both your positives and your negatives right and so that's understandable yes it is necessary that for you to accept how god made you and who he got he made you to be but self-acceptance by its very name is still focused on self <laughs> And the problem with believing that self-acceptance is the key is that it basically says the secret is to love yourself more. This is what self-acceptance is all about. I need to love myself more. I need to respect myself. There is, like I said, there is validity to boundaries. That's a whole other topic again, which we're not going to get into. But the problem is actually not that people don't love themselves enough it it might could be that they love themselves so much that that's all that they focus on and their acceptance or on avoiding rejection so in order for me to accept myself i have to avoid all other forms of rejection you can see how that would be very difficult in this world so it's, I love myself so much that I want to protect myself from being hurt or from being controlled by others to the point that even something as simple as disagreeing with me can cause me to feel rejected. And so therefore, in order to accept myself, I will reject you first. We've all seen this play out, whether in our own lives or in other people's lives, you know, you have. <laughs> so... <clears throat> We can acknowledge, though, that even, in, even though I know in my head that God accepts me, I still need to do something to feel it. And so then I'm focused on how I'm feeling. I'm desperate to not feel this way. And so the result of self-acceptance is that having our own needs met becomes more important than accepting others. The bottom line is basically that without Christ's solution, people will stay on this treadmill <laughs> of self-effort until they collapse. Some of, some of you have already collapsed, whether physically or emotionally or mentally, we've all kind of been there. We have all collapsed at some point because it doesn't work. It's exhausting. <laughs> but then we have the system of grace god's way of gaining acceptance is the system of grace and it is based on receiving by faith what god did in me through christ which is forgiveness of sins and the gift of righteousness it's not based on me that is the most wonderful news i've ever heard <laughs> it is not based on me Romans 3, 21 through 22 says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. That's it. Believe. That is our one job, <laughs> is to believe that he has made us righteous. Because God's system of grace and his acceptance is based on being righteous in my spirit and is nothing at all to do with my performance. The way that I become righteous is by faith in Jesus. So Romans 4, 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. <clears throat> He made us righteous by the death of Jesus. Righteous means perfect, holy, pure. We are in right standing with God. This is what's called exchanged life. Many of you have probably heard that term. He exchanged our unacceptable state of being separated from him because of sin, our sin nature. He exchanged that and he gave us a new spirit that is united with him. There's a scripture for that. We are a new creation in Christ, right? We all know that one. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are made righteous. He gave us a new identity. He chose us to be in his family. And we are now acceptable and perfect because of that. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, really like, as I was studying, I was reading through a lot of these scriptures and I'm like, can I just read this whole book, this whole chapter and that be my sermon? Because, it's, you know, this stuff is really good. So this says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. The focus is always on God and what he has done instead of ourselves. What is he doing? What has he done? This is our focus of, of our acceptance. That's really, it's a very foreign concept for us to wrap our brains around if we're not used to thinking that way. But he becomes the measure of our acceptance, not us. Just simply being produces the right behavior that we so try so hard to do and can't seem to do. But when we live through our righteous spirit, it just happens through no fault of your own. It just happens. We are able to rest in our acceptability in Christ and just live. This is the abundant life that Jesus was talking about. Christ's life is expressed through us. And that is what increases our capacity to accept ourselves and to accept others. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to experience acceptance, because let's face it, we don't want to just know we're accepted. We do want to experience being accepted. We want to have the feeling of acceptance. But in order to experience acceptance, there are a few things that you need to know. First, there is a difference between being acceptable and feeling accepted. We know that. As a believer, you are accepted. You are 100% acceptable because you are in Christ. The state of your being is righteous. It's perfection. It's holiness. And nothing can touch that. Nothing is going to touch that. It cannot be undone. Once you are born into Christ, you cannot be unborn into Christ. There will be times, however, when you feel not accepted, when you feel separated from God, but know that you are not. This is where faith comes in. Most Christians have a hard time accepting who we are. We do. Because most don't think that we measure up to God's standard. It's that whole thing again about, well, I need to... I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. I need to be, I, I need to go to more, more church services. I need to go to more Bible studies. You know, I don't know, pick it, pick whatever it is. We have a standard that we think is God's standard that we adopt onto ourselves. And so therefore we sort of, it keeps us from fully accepting who we are. So we're, but this is when we get stuck believing the lies that we've learned in the past, which is that acceptance is based on our behavior. But God's standard is not behavior. I know I've said it many times, but I'm saying it again. God's standard is not behavior. His standard is Christ's spirit in you. Christ's spirit. Would anyone argue that Christ's spirit is not perfect? No, of course, Christ's spirit is perfect. Christ's spirit is holy. Well, guess what? That's in you. And so therefore, that is what makes you holy. Guilty by association kind of thing. You know? <laughs> Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you died, meaning your old spirit with the sin nature died, and your life, meaning your new spirit with his divine nature, is hidden with Christ in God. It's hidden. It's protected. So the answer when you feel unacceptable is not to do to be accepted, but to process through why you are feeling unacceptable and bring that into the righteousness of Christ and see how that 
you know, does that hold up to right to the righteous person that you actually are? No, it's never going to. Another thing to be aware of is that yes, sin, you go, cause we all sin. I'm going to admit it. We all make mistakes. Sin can break your fellowship with God. And that is because we typically tend to shy away when we're living in the flesh. We shy away from God. And he will allow us to live that way. He'll allow us to walk after the flesh because he doesn't force himself on us. But sin is not powerful enough to destroy the redemptive work that Christ has done in you. It's just not. You are still righteous because of that righteousness, because the righteousness is not based on you. It's based on Christ's spirit in you. And he's not going anywhere. So sin can break your fellowship with God, but God's acceptance of you never moved. Not, not even a little, never moved. The third thing is that it is okay to want to be accepted by other people. I mean, we all want to have relationships and we all want uh, people in our lives and we all want to be in community in order to do that. People have to like us, right? <laughs> uh, it's okay to want that. And it's okay <clears throat> to want to be accepted by others. But it cannot define us. Or we'll go right back into the performance-based acceptance, which does not work. God's acceptance is completely sufficient to meet that deep soul need. And then we are blessed with community uh, the community of others. God's acceptance is what gives us the capacity to endure loneliness and rejection from others. You will be lonely at some point. You will be rejected and it's okay. You will be okay. I know I've said that a lot. You will be okay. And that is because of Christ's and of God's acceptance of you. You know, Jesus had the capacity to bear more rejection than probably any of us will experience. I mean, they killed him outright. Uh, he, uh, he had the capacity to bear extreme rejection because he knew he was completely accepted by his father. And the fourth thing is believing that you are accepted and acceptable to God is a choice. It is a choice. Settle the question of your acceptability once and for all in your mind. Make the choice and let God do the rest. And you'll be like, well, I don't know how to make that choice. I don't know what that feels like. Yes, you do. We all know what it's like to choose to believe something that we have no proof of. Amazon reviews, uh, <laughs> what our doctors tell us, all kinds of things we read online. We accept it's true when we have no proof. So we know what it feels like to choose to believe something. <laughs> so choose to believe that you are accepted by God. That's when you can live in the faith of knowing, not just knowing in your head, but understanding, which will in turn allow you to fully accept yourself and will give you greater capacity to accept others. So that, you know, there's a lot more that I could say about being accepted, but um, I'm trying to fit two of these in one uh, sermon. So I'm going to move on to worth. <laughs> but if keep everything in mind about acceptance um, as we go through worth, because they are actually closely related. So I've used the terms worth and value interchangeably. I always thought that they meant the same thing, but I have learned that while they're really close, they're, they do have uh, some differences. There is a difference, albeit it might be very nuancy, but it is different. So the definition of worth is the cost of a particular item. So whatever, whatever something is worth is fixed. Generally speaking, something would be the same worth across the board. You will pay the same thing for this item as I would if you go to a store, that's its worth. <clears throat> so the value though, is the significance and importance of a particular item. So there's an emotional component to value. 
value, uh, it does take into account cost to a point, but it's mostly the emotional attachment. So like, okay, time is valuable. You can't put a price tag on time. So some people have tried. Um, sentimental items, you could, you, some, you could value something that costs 50 cents and it's very valuable to you because of sentimental things. So that's what value is. So um, when I, so like if you compare diamonds and water, for instance, this will give you a clear picture of the difference. A diamond is worth thousands of dollars. And let's say I have a water bottle that's worth $2. That's, you know, what we would pay for them. However, if I get stuck on a, on a desert island, um, the diamond is still worth thousands of dollars but the $2 bottle of water has now become invaluable to me as it will keep me alive. <laughs> so you see the difference between the two. So, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is getting hoarse. When, when looking at how acceptance and worth are connected, I would say that acceptance speaks to your sense of belonging. You know, we, we wanna belong, we have to be accepted. Worth speaks to your sense of value within that place of belonging. And so why we need to know what we're worth. Understanding your worth is obviously what allows you to feel worthy and it allows us to feel valued. We cannot feel valued. We cannot feel that we are worthy unless we understand our worth. <clears throat> It, it, it is essential to receiving lasting breakthrough and healing. Um, it's what allows us to live freely, to come before God boldly, to come before the throne of grace, um, to receive healing. So many people maybe don't receive healing. They don't even want to ask for prayer because they feel completely unworthy to even ask for prayer for healing. And that is because they feel unworthy. <clears throat> So uh, most people at some time in their lives struggle with feelings of worthlessness and they feel that they're not valued. We have all, I mean, everybody, at least at their job, has at some point feel, felt devalued at some point. Um, anytime we come across other people, that seems to happen. <laughs> but these, they come from messages that we receive from all around us. And a lot, of, a lot of times these messages go way back to uh, the messages we receive when we're children. How our parents raised us, you know, our siblings, our interactions with teachers and friends and things, those all speak very strongly into our sense of worth. Um, the messages we tell ourselves based on our interpretations of everything that happens to us, it all settles in it's mixed up and becomes those distorted belief systems that Ryan was talking about last week. But the tools to measure our worth and value apart from Christ are always going to be the wrong tools. So here's a question to ask yourself. How do you personally measure your worth? If you struggle with feelings of worthlessness or you have before or that you are not valuable, what are, your, what are you measuring by? Most of us have a standard that we're probably not even conscious that we have, um, but it probably wouldn't take a whole lot of searching for you to really see, you know, what it is it that I am measuring myself by. A lot of people, so here's some common ones, how happy and content you are, how important your job is and how good you are at it, how smart you are, how useful you are to others and to God, how successful you've been at improving yourself, how much scripture you know, how good or bad your prayer life is. Um, these are some pretty common things that we unconsciously measure our worth by. It's almost like we view ourselves as a stock on Wall Street. When the company is doing really good, then we're worth a lot. And when the company is not doing good, we tank. So that's a very, it's a very flip floppy way that we live. But if you don't know what you measure your worth by, I would encourage you to take the time to just, I mean, it wouldn't take long to just recognize the standard that you're using. 
Apart from God, feeling worthy is, just like acceptance, all about self. Self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-respect, self-love, self-care, self-acceptance. Our spiritual journey becomes all about ourselves. Now, there's some things that I listed there that are not evil in and of themselves. Self-care is a huge word these days because people have forgotten how to set boundaries and people have forgotten to take care of themselves. And I'm not saying that that's an evil thing to do. It is not. But the journey of self-worth at its core is you trying to set your own price tag. You are trying to determine your own intrinsic value to yourself, to others, and to God. And it's just not possible for us to do that because of, because we haven't accepted ourselves and we haven't, we're, we don't think we're worth very much. We can't determine our own identity. You probably have heard me say that in the past and we can't set our own worth. It's not possible. Self-worth can go one of two ways, positive self-worth or negative self-worth, but both are still focused on self. So <clears throat> here's a quote that I read when I was preparing this, this um, from the internet again. <laughs> Your worth is entirely up to you. You are worthy because you say you're worthy and because you believe it. Look within and trust that you are enough. So what I did was I did a search for worth and worthy on the internet and you can't do a search for worth or worthy without all the results being about self-worth. This is the most common view out there on, on the internet. This is the most common view of people, but it's an illusion and a lie. And if you have been, if you have been highly affected by trauma, the thought that you are responsible for your own worth is just too big. It's too big and it's hopeless. I mean, that's where, that's where you're at your lowest. How can you determine what you're worth if you've been through huge trauma and, and you're very wounded? It's just not possible because that's not your job. That's, that's the good news. <laughs> so apart from God, the number one thing that we equate worth and value to is personal accomplishment. Doesn't matter how big or small the accomplishment is, we will grab hold of anything and we will use it. Whether it's, you know, getting a, a promotion at work or it's getting a small boost from reaching a new level on our internet game. You know, it's if we've helped a friend or if we nailed it during that prayer time, you know, that's, that's, that's boosting my worth right there. Uh, consciously or unconsciously, like I said, we use these things to measure our worth. There is a much better standard for us though, and that is God's measure of worth. So Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God's measure of worth never changes. It is constant because he is constant. And the worth and value that he has ascribed to us is just like acceptance. It is based on what Christ has done. It is an outpouring of his love and his love is eternal and it is everlasting. And it is praise the Lord, not based on what I do or what I don't do. I would highly encourage you to read through, I was going to put these on here, but it's, they're just too long. Psalm 121, which is actually a really short chapter, but Psalm 121 and Psalm 139. Read those because it is a beautiful picture of how much God values us and how much we are worth to him. So 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
God has put a price tag on you. Did you know that? You have a price. So your worth is equal to the price. And our price tag is the blood of Jesus. That is what he paid to buy us, essentially. So value is the significance and the importance to the buyer. So the father paid his asking price, which was the blood of Jesus, because we are significant and important to him. It was worth it to him to pay that for us. Not just because we were made in his image, but because we were made to be his sons and his daughters. Um, I'm going to sort of rapid fire through some of these scriptures. First Peter 2 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Romans 8 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up from us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So many scriptures talk about what we are worth to God, how much he values us. We are worthy because of Christ. He made us his sons and his daughters by the death of Jesus, and we belong to him as his children. 2 Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He's already stated it. He gave us a new identity, chose us to be in his family, and we are now acceptable and perfect and in union with him. 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Being his child is what makes you pure. Being his child is what makes, that is your worth. You are his child. So in order to experience worth, there are a few things that you need to know. Uh, The first one, just like acceptance, there is a difference between being worthy and feeling valued. As a believer, you are worthy. You are 100% worthy because you are in Christ. Nothing you do will make you any more or less expensive to God. He already paid for you. Nothing, nothing you do will decrease or increase your value to him. The price was paid and your value was set for all eternity because Christ never changes and Christ in you never changes. So from here on out, anything and everything that you experience that tells you otherwise is a lie and you don't have to believe that lie. The second thing to, that you need to know is that understanding your worth increases your capacity to handle the lies that, you, that come your way. Because, you know, the lies will still come. They will. He doesn't, the, the enemy does not stop. His tactics never change and he does not stop. What does change is the power of those lies. So believing what God says about you over what the enemy or the world throws out you or even what you tell yourself, um, that is putting faith into action. Ephesians 6.16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. doesn't say that the fiery darts won't come, but that you will be able to quench them. You will be able to defeat them because of faith. Faith in he, in who he says he is and in who he says you are. So feeling unworthy or not feeling valuable is not powerful enough to destroy the redemptive work that Christ has done in us. No matter what you do or don't do, think or don't think, you are still worth the blood of Christ because your worth and value is based on that, not on you. You know, the... The dollar value of the blood of Christ doesn't change. I mean, (laughs) you know, our dollar value goes up and down all the time. But the currency of heaven, the blood of Christ, is totally constant. The third thing is, it is okay to want to feel valued by others. 
we all want to feel that we're contributing and we all want to feel that we're making a difference in people's lives, right? Let's just be honest. But it cannot define us. The worth and value that God has placed on us is completely sufficient to meet the deep soul need even when we can't do anything. <laughs> even when we're not doing anything. Jesus knew exactly who he was and what he was worth, which gave him the capacity to stand firm when people told him different, because people did tell him different. They told him all sorts of things. And it's the same for us. We will have that same capacity. So just, <clears throat> I know I'm going a little bit late, but I just wanted to real quick, um, I was looking through my journal the other day and I came across one particular entry from several years ago. Um, this was when God had really started speaking to me about identity. Um, and you know, there is power in believing what God says. And these words that I heard him speak, um, brought such healing to me, even though I didn't fully understand it at the time. So when I, when I wrote this entry, I was going through Psalm 139 and I was taking one verse at a time and I was just letting him speak to me about that verse. And so I wanted to read you what he told me one time, uh, because I really feel like it was a treasured word of the Lord for me, but I feel like he feels like, he feels like this about all of his kids. <laughs> so I, I believe this is a word for you too. And what I heard him say was, <clears throat> I am before you and behind you. I am in your future and in your past. As I chart your path, I'm also clearing it, not of the things that you would necessarily want, but of the things I want cleared. And I walk behind you to pick up and heal the things in you that happened before. I will give you wisdom and perspective, wisdom for what's ahead and perspective to accurately see what's behind. You are blessed wherever you go because I have blessed you. I have placed my hand on your head as a declaration that you are mine. You are heavenly royalty. You are clothed in the majesty of heaven. You are washed and made clean by my blood, and I have given you a place in my family. An inheritance and a legacy is yours by rights, because I love you. I love you and I died for you. And it is my pleasure to bless you, to give you purpose, to heal you, to fill you with joy and love and peace, to awaken passions within you, to help you discover who you are in me, to throw off the identity the world has given you, to break the chains of the identity you've given yourself, to move, live, and be comfortable in the identity that I have always had for you. I know who you are. That is the God who values you. He spoke those words to me, and um, I know it was him. First of all, it is based on scripture, but I know it was him because I looked at the date of this entry, and it was before Ryan and I came to Grace. It was before I understood my identity. Um, it was before I really could see and understand all of these things. And everything that he has said here has come true. Amen. And it is still true. Yeah. And it's true for you as well. So I hope that you take that word and believe it because it is true. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you have fully and totally accepted us. You have accepted us because you love us, because of the blood of Christ. Lord, that you paid the price that was needed for our redemption and that we are forever changed. We are forever a new creation. And Lord, we are forever in your family never to be taken away. Lord, I thank you that our life is hidden in Christ and that nothing and no one can separate us from it. I thank you, God, 
that you love and that you shower your love on every single person here. Lord, I pray that you would give revelation and freedom and breakthrough to those that need it. Lord, to know that they are accepted. Lord, that they are worth so much that we can't, we can't even comprehend how much we are worth to you. But I thank you, Lord, that you show us every day. And Lord, speak to their hearts and heal their hurts in Jesus' name. We praise you and we bless you. We honor you for what you have done and who you are. Amen. Amen. Amen.